Since the beginning of human history, Ireland has been a pioneer in science. From the origins of astronomy at Newgrange to the discovery of the pulsar by Jocelyn Bell Brunel, Ireland's scientific heritage is undisputed. But many don't know about Dublin's very own piece of astronomical heritage. Located at the heart of Dublin, the Dias Dunsink Observatory is Ireland's most iconic observatory. Now part of the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, Dunsink was once the centre for investigation. From measuring the distances to the stars to timekeeping, it was once one of the most important observatories of Ireland and Europe for much of the 19th century. Some of the greatest minds the world has ever seen lived here, and its walls witness fascinating discoveries. Dunsink has changed the world in many different ways. It's time to get going again. The Dunsink Observatory really is one of Ireland's great historical buildings. It was founded in the 1780s by Provost Andrews from Trinity College Dublin after he'd been around the continent on a grand tour and he saw that they, there were these great observatories being built. And with those observatories, people were looking for new planets and trying to find new planets. And he thought that when he came back to Dublin, Ireland should have an observatory like that. But he didn't do it while he was alive. He waited until he was dead. And in his will, he left £3,000 to establish a chair of astronomy at Trinity, but also to build the observatory. And his family were very upset about this, not happy at all. And they ended up in court and college won. And nowadays we have Dunsink Observatory that we can still now enjoy as part of kind of our scientific uh, heritage. So the plans for the observatory were quite grand initially and uh, this shows what they had in mind at the time. These lovely wings on either side for both the assistants to live and for the uh, for the astronomer royal or the royal astronomer of Ireland to live and then in the centre was the operating part of the building so it was both a home um, and also a place but the £3,000 that he left wasn't enough actually and it ended up that we didn't have the wings so the observatory ended up being a little bit truncated from what the original plans are, were, and we ended up with an observatory that looks like this nowadays. The observatory was founded in 1785, and the idea of it was to work out time and also longitude. So for mariners, it was really important to know where they were and what the time was as they went out across uh, to find the new world and to, uh, to explore the new world. But at the time, there were big questions around planets. Was there other planets in our solar system? So at the time, Uranus hadn't been discovered. Uh, Neptune hadn't been discovered, so they were yet to be discovered. And also, people didn't know what the distances to the stars were. So I guess the big reasons for it in astronomical terms was to find maybe new planets and also to work out the distances to the stars. So one of the primary jobs of the observatory was to keep time and to keep a standard time for Ireland. That was called Dublin Standard Time. And those times were kept in the Meridian Room. And then there was two, um, if not three, uh, cables that went from Dunsink Observatory into the city centre. One of them went to Trinity so that the uh, experimental scientists could set their times. One went to the bank so the bank could keep an eye on the time. And then one went to Dublin Port as well. And Dublin Port that allowed mariners to set their clocks and, and their, uh, calculate their longitude very ac accurately. Um, and it was between, right up actually until 1916, that Dublin Standard Time was kept in the Meridian Room. Um, and the difference then between Greenwich Time or Greenwich Mean Time, and here was 25 minutes and 21 seconds. It must be very interesting at the time because if you went to a railway station at that time, there could be two clocks, one which was Dublin Standard Time and one, one which was Greenwich mean, Greenwich mean Time, and they were set offset by 25 minutes and 21 seconds. So who knows what time the, 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 the train was going to arrive at, just quite amazing. Um, and apparently there's a story of the Protestant Trinity saying that he was late for a meeting one time because he was following Dunstan Standard Time rather than Greenwich Mean Time. So great excuse. Dunsink was once the home of perhaps Ireland's most prolific scientist. William Rowan Hamilton was appointed as Dunsink's director at the young age of 21 while he was still an undergraduate at the University of Dublin Trinity College. He made astonishing contributions in physics and mathematics, in optics, algebra, mechanics, you name it. The man was a genius. But Hamilton is famous for mainly two things. First, the Hamiltonian a mathematical tool that absolutely revolutionized classical mechanics and is widely used in quantum mechanics. Have you heard of the Schrodinger equation? But Hamilton's genius went beyond the Hamiltonian. 
to give us something more, something that was definitely ahead of his time. In this same bridge, Hamilton came up with quaternions, a new type of number. Hamilton's invention of quaternions was very groundbreaking within mathematics. It's a really new way of describing rotation and orientation in 3D space using four-dimensional numbers. Quaternions uh, actually are quite an interesting concept because they're very complex to get your head around and I think Hamilton was quite ahead of his time. Um, it wasn't really until the 20th century that we caught up with quaternions and started using them with our technology nowadays. Quaternions are really heavily used in aircraft and, and spacecraft for aviation and space industry and because it's all about 3D rotation in space. And so if you have an, an aircraft and you do slight movements in your Euler notation, your pitch in your roll in your yaw, that's usually okay, but if you suddenly make a huge disruption like this, that's gonna cause that gimbal lock problem. Quaternions solve this. We don't end up with these issues with pointing, um, and it makes it much, much easier to use for these control systems rather than the traditional methods. Dias and, and Dunsink have quite a history of uh, lunar research, actually, and gimbal lock was a problem during the Apollo missions, so those original missions to the moon, particularly in Apollo 11 when you had the Eagle lander, they had a problem with gimbal lock. Now, quick thinking on the astronauts' part, solved um, the problem, but it could have been quite a catastrophic failure. And if we had used quaternions instead of that traditional Euler notation, we wouldn't have had that problem. And it's, it's kind of a quicker, and it's also more computationally less storage, so it's quite a, a, a good way of using um, um, your, your computers to determine these orientations. Since the 80s, NASA has been using quaternions for their space missions, so it's quite the default setting these days, um, rather than the traditional notations. Perhaps Dunsink's most iconic addition was made in 1863. Sir James South, a retired medical practitioner and a man of great wealth, had acquired a lens of excellent quality and one of the largest ones at the time. It cost him about 1,200 pounds, which in today's standards is the price of a supercar. Not bad for a piece of glass. See, in astronomy, the bigger the lens, the more powerful it becomes meaning that you can see things that are further away with better detail. And James South wanted a telescope mount that would match this level of quality. However, he wasn't capable of building such a great telescope, and in 1861 he donated the lens to Trinity College Dublin. But he didn't get along with Hamilton, and so construction of the telescope was deferred until after Hamilton's death. Hamilton's successor, Franz Bruno, hired a company from Rathmine specialized in the manufacture of telescopes. Grubb no longer operates, but their telescope still does. The telescope was primarily being used as a way of measuring the distances to the stars. It used a method called parallax. See, when the Earth moves around the Sun, the stars that are closer to us appear to move much more than the stars that are much further from us some geometry, and you can find the distances to the stars. Take your thumb, for example, and then close each one of your eyes. Then move your thumb a little bit closer and do the exact same thing. You'll see that your thumb will move from side to side. However, if you put it far away, it won't move as much. That is parallax. Dunsink has survived the passing of time, but not without scars. In 1977, a devastating fire took this room, and with it, a lunar rock from Apollo 11 that was unknown by NASA was lost. It is thought that this moon rock is now either in the dump or underneath this floor. Unfortunately, the moon rock is so small that it would be practically impossible to find. Today, Dunsink is considered a site of Irish historical importance, and it aims to become a center for scientific outreach, where thousands of visitors come to listen to some of Ireland's most notable scientists. It is the home of exhibition spaces with incredible instruments, such as the one used to prove Einstein's theory of relativity, the manuscripts of Hamilton's formulations and notations, 
and the clock's use for Dublin time. Dunsink is not just a building of historical importance, it is a place to inspire future generations, a place to rediscover Ireland's astronomical history, to rediscover our solar system, a place that will transport you to the other side of the galaxy. It is our responsibility to conserve it and to keep it alive, to maintain its legacy and show it to the world. Dunsink is not just a historical building, Dunsink is our heritage. Thank you.